Ventures. Welcome to Eco Ask Why. We have a very special episode today, and we're tackling women in industry and talking specifically about women in leadership. And I have a panel. It's an amazing panel. A couple of returning guests. I have Natalie Birdwell. She's returning from Industrial.io. I have Megan Sanford. She's returning with us. She's at, at Snyder Electric. And then we have Lee Chapman. She's at True Marketing. And you eco ask why listeners may know Wendy Covey at True Marketing. When I told Wendy what we were doing, she's like, you got to get Lee on here. So I'm like, all right, Wendy, we trust you. We love you. So we, we're so excited to have Lee. So thank you, ladies, for joining us. I'm so excited to see how this conversation you know, evolves and where we go and where you, where you take it. And, and maybe, you know, Natalie, get us started. And when, when you think about women in leadership, what's different? for those women in leadership positions in the industrial sector. Sure, well, thanks Chris for um, getting us together today and I'm excited to be here both with Lee and Megan. So um, I'm I'm looking forward to our conversation. Uh, Difference, I think there's there's a fair amount of difference. I think it kind of depends on what stage of your career that you're at. But one of the things that really pops out in my head is so much of industry, a lot of us have really technical backgrounds and have mm-hmm. been focused on kind of the the tactical. And it's, you know, that adage of what got you here isn't going to kind of take you to the next step. And so being able to, um, you know, even though we're in really technical industries and it's focused on you know, that tactical aspect and how to get things done, it's being able to do that transition to the what we're trying to do and why we're trying to do it um, to take that kind of leadership angle um, to the next level. And and I see that in a lot of ways, especially for women, you want to kind of, you know, make sure that you deliver and get all of the things done and all of the things checked off the list and and having that little bit of shift in mindset to remember, hey, we, we need to keep our eye on establishing the what and the why. Um, as as you're moving into to those leadership roles, so very good. How, how about you know when when you think about that, Megan? What what comes to mind for you? Um, particularly for me, I think being a, a female leader in this industry is really about, in my experience, creating space. And that I think that when you're very uh, clear as a leader on the impact that you're trying to drive for an organization. And generally, you allow everyone on the team to understand what their role is. Everyone's role is respected, and they're allowed to play that role. I think that people are very responsive to that, to that type of leadership style. And generally, as a leader, I try to get out of people's way. Uh, I try to give them uh, space to do their job and be empowered to do their, draw, to do their uh, job and to drive impact. And as long as we're clear about everyone's role being respected and then being allowed to drive that impact, people naturally step up to the plate. It's kind of the mentality of being your own mini CEO. It doesn't matter how large or how small your program is. If you are a leader that is respected and people people feel respected under your leadership and feel that they're being trusted and that their role is being respected, um, the impact and, and the results tend to naturally follow that order. Mm-hmm. No doubt. Absolutely. I love that, that, that many CEO mentality. That, that is, that is so critical. How about you, Lee? Yeah, I think a lot of what Natalie and Megan have said really echoes with me. And I would say, you know, setting strong expectations is always key listening. You know, as you move up in the leadership ranks, it becomes less about you doing the work and more about you managing and directing the work of others. And sometimes that can be really tough. Uh, A lot of us are sometimes control freaks. We're multitaskers. We're used to checking all the boxes, right? And so really stepping back and looking at where you can have the most impact in your organization and recognizing that that's going to look a little bit different and Mm -hmm. enabling others to grow uh, up through the ranks, I think, is, is something that we try to focus on. No doubt. I've been reading a book lately and he's talking about you know, from a traditional management standpoint, you try to like direct and it's, sh- it's shifting to coach, the, the coaching mindset and that servant leadership, serving others mindset. And that, that takes a different type of, of philosophy and, 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 and approach, particularly when you're managing people to be able to give up that control 
and tr- and give people some autonomy to make you know to make decisions for their own. Give that you know that flexibility. And to fail, right? I mean, which as yeah. women, a lot of us grew up feeling like, yeah. what, fail? We can't fail. We have to be perfect. And I always tell people, take perfect out of your vocabulary. If you're not pushing yourself out of your comfort zone, if you're not afraid to risk anything, you're not going to be able to achieve. And so I think, again, as much as we can mentor and coach, as you said, Chris, that into kind of this this next generation of female leaders, so they feel like they've got that kind of permission to to not have to be perfect, but to help be a part of uh, failing forward. That's right. That's right. I love it. I love it. Now, again, with this with this series, we're going to try to touch on some topics and get to the heart of what's important, particularly for our listeners out there that are wanting to learn. So just, you know, straightforward question. Is it a level playing field for women in entry right now? Uh, Natalie? Um, <laughs> I feel like I'm always starting. Uh, yeah, I think it's evolved. You know, I look back okay. over my career and I think that um, that there's definitely some some advantages that have come about. And I think that there's definitely still some of those hurdles, um, you know, just from a, a kind of mentality standpoint of um, women coming into leadership roles. Lee, you had a great point there of that perfectionism, right? And so um, trying to, to kind of level that playing field from an expectation standpoint, even of, of yourself as you, you're starting to um, rise through the ranks. And I'm starting to see a lot more um, folks that are advocates. Um, early on in my career, it was, if there wasn't really a strong, um, you know, female leadership within the company, then there wasn't a lot of advocates for females rising within the company. And I'm starting to see a lot of that change, which I think is great, um, both, uh, you know, across the board and a lot of the efforts around DEI and um, things that, you know, small companies and large corporations are, are taking on and um, starting to, to put forth, I think, some meaningful change at a personal level, not just at an organizational level. I, I think there's a lot of positive shifts in, in the types of leaders that we're seeing emerge these days, um, which I think is starting to, to level up some of Okay. So you, you're seeing it moving in the right direction then? I think we're, we're taking some positive steps. Taking some good steps. That's okay. That's progress. That's progress. How about you, Megan? Yes, I, I believe that the, the playing field is definitely being leveled in terms of women being able to be in a position to be leaders within this industry. In other words, I feel like the door is open. The door is open for females to walk through and have a significant leadership presence in the industry. I think that the industry is very receptive to it. You see recruitment numbers for uh, for female leaders in our industry skyrocketing. We see the pull. We see that the door is open. You know, I think that where the the challenge and the good work still remains is a, a quote that my boss actually said a few weeks ago, and I wrote it down. And I almost want to like tape it on my wall. And that's you know the ability as leaders to deal with the day to day tension that is required to impose a new reality. And really it's the day-to-day tension and being able to sit with that tension and to kind of push through it, to push through the tension that's required to impose new change and a new reality. That is really the skill, the one skill I would say that's required to be a female executive in this industry. Mm -hmm. So is that that tension more for the female executives? I think it, it, it can be uh, depending on how you position yourself on certain topics, right? I think that as females, we 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 are naturally um, we we naturally are skilled at diplomacy. We know how to connect people. We know how to bring people in. We know how to uh, elicit um, response and input to problems. Uh, I think in some cases what feels a bit unnatural is is the tension, is the, the positive conflict, right? And understanding positive conflict versus, you know, a personal criticism or we may be, we may be afraid to uh, be viewed as being um, in disagreement, right? And being able to sit in that disagreement 
and to disagree, but in a positive and constructive way, and how others may view us as being, um, you know, um, not as amenable or being willing to kind of come down on a topic hard, whereas our, you know, some of our mayor, our, our male peers, uh, while the diplomacy may not come as naturally to them, uh, the conflict and the uh, ability to kind of sit in a messy problem, I, I think, can come more naturally to men because they're they're brought up and raised in a way where, you know, conflict and competition is more healthy. I think that's a that's a great point. And I feel like building on that, um, something I heard uh, recently, um, my son is a freshman this year majoring in computer science at Colorado School of Mines, and they were really emphasizing it's not about competition, it's about collaboration. And I was like, yes, that's exactly it. It's going from this more typically traditionally competitive world um, and leadership and getting to those leadership positions of how do we collaborate? How do we build through teams um, to kind of help open those doors? And I think, Megan, you're right. The kind of the, the diplomacy skills that, that women tend to bring to the table, the listening skills that we have, I think really are a nice balance. I think it levels up the entire, you know, executive team to have this, this balance and diversity. Um, you know, I'll say that, you know, when I, previous to True, I worked at National Instruments. Um, and when I hired on at National Instruments in the early 2000s, there were no women uh, on the executive team and leadership roles at National Instruments. Today, there's, I, there's dozens. Uh, so I definitely see that, uh, Natalie, as you were saying, the doors are now open. Um, and there's, I think much more receptiveness to the value that women leaders can bring. And I think it's, it's doing it on our terms, not following the, the traditional uh, mold for what it means to be a leader, but bringing our assets, our strengths um, to the boardrooms. I, I love that Lee, because there's in that collaboration aspect and, and there's two sides of that, right? Like if you have the collaboration mindset, if everyone in the room has that mindset, then kind of these predispositions or um, assumptions of, Megan, like you were saying, if you, if you take a hard stand, sometimes it's interpreted differently than if your male counterpart takes a hard stand. And so um, if everybody comes to the table with that collaboration mindset, it, it's such a game changer, I think. Um, I agree, completely agree with all that. I mean, when you, when you think about you know, wh where I get a lot of my good ideas, and try to bounce them off. It's with my wife. I mean, I think that she she gives me that perspective, and that and I take that collaboration, in, you know, to heart because you know I may be seeing this this point or this view this one way because of just my male mind, or like you said, like like you ladies said, the things I grew up with, competition, things like that. She can bring a whole nother approach that I hadn't considered. So I think when that gets to the boardroom. And the executive level and leadership, particularly in the industry, that's where a real change happens, you know. And I am curious, and maybe maybe Lee kick us off on this one. So I'll, I'll give Natalie a break from going first. <laughs> you know, when you what you're seeing out there, true. You know, you have you and Wendy. You definitely got you, you're leading the company. You know, what what are the the biggest moves forward for women wanting to pursue those types of roles in industry? What, what are you seeing there? I would say, you know, the, the biggest moves and, and thanks and some to the, the pandemic is just this uh, increased flexibility, right? And I think men, I think everyone benefits from this too. Um, the flexibility, the remote working style and the tools that help us, you know, work well wherever we are. I think that businesses are now kind of waking up to the fact that you don't have to you know, sit in traffic every day, work in a cubicle and be visibly present 10 hours a day to be a great leader in your company. And so I think having this tools and the flexibility that keeps us all really mentally present and productive, I think that's been a game changer for women. I think that's going to enable more women uh, to assume leadership roles. How about Megan? What are your thoughts? Just in terms of bringing more women into leadership? Yeah, for, for sure. What some of the biggest moves forward for bringing those women into leadership or type roles? You know, we're where Lee was just talking about that increased flexibility that that's being offered right now. Just curious what you're seeing at maybe at Snyder. In my mind, the biggest hurdle that I see women encounter, especially in engineering fields, is that, again, I think the door is wide open for attracting 
female talent in engineering. People, um, people are recognizing the need. There are many DEI initiatives. Where I see and when I mentor other women in the industry, it's getting that first management role. That seems to be kind of the hardest rung in the ladder. And I was mentoring, um, I was mentoring some ladies uh, last week in a, in a group session. And I, I was saying to me that the hardest step in my career was getting the opportunity to lead a team. That once you get that first rung in the ladder, you're able to, to, to progress and to climb once you're in that leadership pool. I think that the way that most companies work is that once you're a leader, you're kind of defined as being put on the leadership track and the opportunities seem to present themselves and become more readily available. But getting to that first step on the ladder where you are officially a manager and you have folks reporting to you, that's the hardest part. And that's that's the challenge that I, I haven't necessarily figured out how to help guide people on other than suggesting to them that they that they position themselves in discussions with management where they could maybe take on a team lead position initially, where maybe they're not an official uh, people leader, but they're officially managing a process or they're pulling and coordinating people together. That's really the first step in my mind when it comes to uh, when it comes to really getting getting women in positions where they can be promoted to running a team and then are are being uh, considered and escalated up the ladder for promotion. Mm -hmm. So is it like practicing at bats? <laughs> That's like practice. That's like practice and getting at bats, right? Just to to get some yeah. of that. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Getting the experience, getting on the radar. In some mm -hmm. in some cases, believe it or not, I I do I do still see where women don't speak up and make it very known that they are interested in a leadership role. Right. I think that there's a mentality with women where we believe. If I if I'm doing a good job, if I am reasonable to get along with, if I show up to work and I'm a team player and I don't behave like a jerk, that I will make it to management, that someone in leadership will recognize that I'm a great person and I will be installed as a manager and this will happen to me and I will wait my turn. And there's a logical sequence to these good things happening to me in my career and I, I just haven't seen that. I have seen evidence of like the, the best women, the smartest women, the most capable, the most collaborative, where they just don't get the opportunity because they don't speak up and they don't say, I want that management role. Tell me what I need to do to get it. They're, they're not as vocal, I think, as men in communicating precisely what they want. They believe that systems work and they believe that the system will eventually select them and things will happen uh, naturally. But in reality, I always encourage women, tell your manager, tell them, hey, I, I would love to make it to a leadership position in three years. That's the target. Can you help me get there? Do you know of other teams? If there's not going to be an opportunity on our team to create another leadership role, Great. Sometimes it works out that way. But is there another opportunity on another team? And can you help me get there? Right. So be clear, you know, put your def your goals out there make it, and vocalize that. Right. That's great advice. How about you, Natalie? I, yeah, I think that's, that's um, great advice, Megan, because there's <laughs> someone outside of our organization told me a couple of weeks ago, she said, I feel like I just need to be more of a jerk to be able to move up. <laughs> and I said, no, you know, be more forward, like you're saying, and, and don't, don't hesitate on that ask, but ask in a direct way and let the, let the big pause happen and be really clear about it. Um, and, and if you're, you're not feeling like you're getting support and progressing, you know, network and, and look for other opportunities where, um, you can get support in that way and where people are open, you know, in a smaller organization and as we're in a high growth mode, a lot of times this comes up and I'll, I'll take it kind of from the management perspective, right? Of, okay, when you're looking to, to hire and if you're having to hire a lot of folks from the outside the organization, um, 
you know, do you hire them into their first management role from outside the organization? Or are you trying to you know, look for folks internally to, to elevate within the organization as well? And, you know, we sit squarely in the middle of that um, for, for both uh, as far as, you know, kind of a, a high growth stage company. Um, and so it's, you know, that, that management aspect of being able to open the aperture a little bit and say, Hey, yeah, let's, let's think about bringing in some folks that maybe like Megan was saying this, they haven't been a manager for 10 years, you know, and, but they, they may bring a lot of other things to the table that could be really, really valuable and, and pay off um, quickly and, and long-term as well. So the, the other thing that I would add to, to both that flexibility, Lee, that you were talking about, because I've seen that just Dermot's really change the opportunities, I feel like, for dual career households and being able to have that flexible environment. And I think, you know, 15 years ago, that wasn't the case at all. Um, it was very, very different, even probably five years ago. But the shift um, is, is to, I think, having women on boards. Um, and seeing it, uh, you know, we're still a privately held company, but you're starting to see more women on boards for publicly traded companies as well as, as privately held. And I think having that diversity of influence at the board level and at that CEO level, and when you're having those conversations on um, growth and kind of you're, you're looking at the, the top leadership and, and having more diversity in your top leadership as well. I feel like having a, you know, more women on boards is such a great driver. Um, and, and then kind of has that opportunity to trickle down while you're, you know, investing in the core of your business and elevating those folks that into management opportunities, right? And having folks that are really direct, like Megan was saying of, hey, I want to do this. I want to get here in three years, you know? Let's let's put together that plan and, and that path. So, um, ha, you know, the holistic approach of um, throughout the entire organization, because when you start to elevate into those management positions, there's no one else at the top that's kind of driving that um, that inclusion and that diversity. Then um, sometimes it feels like like there's that ceiling there too. For sure, absolutely, and that, so. I'm curious for this. You, you three ladies, phenomenal leaders. This is, this, this is the reason that you're part of this women in leadership discussion. I am curious because you know COVID has shifted so much in our lives and the way we work. The way you, everybody's talked about flexibility and the, the way the world's changing. How are you keeping a healthy work-life balance? You know, what does that look like now uh, for women in leadership? And Megan, you haven't kicked us off for for leading us off on the answer, so maybe you can start us off with this one. Oh, I always laugh at work-life balance because I do a horrible job. There is no work-life balance. I mean, I, <laughs> the, um, so many years ago when I was at GE, there was a female executive that came in and I was like starry-eyed. I was like, oh my gosh, you know, this person is here. She's visiting us. You know, I'm awestruck. And someone asked her the same question, like, how do you, how do you do work-life balance? And she was like, I do a horrible job. Honestly, it's, it's horrible. It's all over the place. And I really feel that. And I still really feel that I have two kids. I have a husband. I'm pretty sure my husband still wants to remain married to me, but I mean, at one point in my career, I was traveling 60% of the time he was at home with the kids. And this is really funny. And Lee and Natalie, I want to ask you if you've had the same thing happen, if you have children and you travel, but uh, whenever I travel, uh, if I'm meeting new, new coworkers and things like that, uh, I find that they'll, they'll try to engage in small talk, you know, it's, it's polite, it's we're, we're exchanging, we're getting to know one another, and they'll say, oh, you know, I, you, you traveled in for the meeting, you know, how are things going? You know, oh, you've got, you've got a husband and kids, you know, how are the kids? How old are they? And then it's like, oh, you know, um, where, where, where are the kids when you're traveling? And I've gotten into the habit of like joking with them now where I'm just like, oh crap. Like, I, I guess I just forgot about the kids. I forgot about the kids. I forgot about them. I don't know where they are. Right. But it's like, you would never ask a man like, oh, you know, like, 
what are you, what are you doing with the kids? Where are the kids? Right. But they, they ask, they ask women because it feels natural and it feels like a conversation starter and they're not trying to offend me or anything like that. And so I joke, they're trying to establish connection with me and they're, and, and I, I have the courage to be vulnerable and to throw a joke out there to lighten the moment um, because it is, it's a, it's a lot, it can be a lot of stress. I mean, anyone that says that, you know, it's not stressful to be a female executive or to be traveling or trying to manage, you know, middle school recitals on this, or, you know, first grade, my son can't, you know, sit still in his desk and, you know, we're having issues there and trying to work through different things. All of that still comes into play. And sometimes I feel like I do a horrible job of it, but I think we all do. But again, it's, it's that I go back to the concept of can you sit in the tension of, of dealing with it, right? And can you maintain a positive attitude? And can you see kind of the silver lining through it all? Because the work's important. I love the work. The family's important. I love them too. And I guess that there is a balance. But with myself, I personally never feel like I do a great job. But in reality, I, I guess we're all fed and we're all warm and goals are being met. So I guess it all is working out. But I don't know any female that personally believes that she's knocking it out of the ballpark with work-life balance. That's, I think you're right. I, and I've absolutely had that happen to me when I've been traveling, Megan, where I have had a well-intentioned, you know, person I'm meeting with ask me where the kids are. And I'm like, well, you know, my husband's, obviously my husband's looking out for them. Like they're, I did, I did remember them. They're, they're around. One of my first jobs right out of college was with a, a state agency here in Texas. And the, it was, I mean, and it was back in the nineties where it was just a thing where it was like, we're going to have work-life balance. And it was all about going around. I would, I would travel Texas and I would talk to these companies about how to help them set up work-life balance. And it was always funny. It was never, there were never men in the room. It was only the women in the room. Would, that those were the people who came to these sessions to learn about it because it wasn't seen as something that men needed to worry about. But if you were going to be, you know, a career woman in the workforce, you needed to learn early on, you know, these tips and tricks to have work-life balance, which, you know, we know it's, it's a, it's a goal, it's a dream, but it's tougher, much tougher to achieve. You know, I would say now, you know, now an empty nester, it's, it's seeming great. But I remember those days of like coming home from work and you're picking up your kid from daycare and you're, um, you know, making the, the bottles for the next day and cooking dinner. And you're, it's, you know, you're hoping you're going to get to sleep at night because you've got a huge presentation the next day. And I do feel really lucky that, you know, my husband has definitely carried uh, his share of the workload as well, or I wouldn't have been able to do what I've done. There were times we were traveling where we, you know, high-fived each other at the airport and our moms were able to step in and look after the kids mm -hmm. if we both had something going on. But we've tried to have that collaboration in our marriage too. So both of us can have the careers that we want to have. And that, you know, like you said, Megan, the kids are fed, we're healthy. Um, and, you know, when I traveled, I, you know, my goal when I came home is I, the house doesn't have to be clean. I just think everybody needs to be alive. Like that's, that's the goal. As long <laughs> as everybody's alive, we're winning. Um, and I, I think it's, it's getting easier. There's more of a openness to everyone understanding that I have, I have men tell me all the time on calls. Oh, you know, I do you mind? I'm just going to hold my baby on the call. My wife's in you know, another room on it. I love that. I feel like that was something you didn't see five or 10 years ago. It just seems like men are really um, stepping up in a big way and supporting their wives. And so I think through that, you know, we'll never be perfectly equal in, in work-life balance, but I think it's getting better. I got, I got to jump in here real quick, uh, Lee, because you just mentioned something. It literally happened yesterday. Our baby, we have a three month old and we got a call from daycare. They called me because I, I live, I take the kids to carpool. My wife works a little bit further away. So I went and picked her up. I, I was in a one-on-one -on -one meeting. And, and the guy I was with, I was like, I got to go. I'm going to call you back. So when I call him back about an hour later, because Lily, she was fine. So I was like, all right, we're doing this one-on-one. -on -one, but my three-month-old is in my lap. So that's just the way it is. And he was like, hey, bro, let's do it. So we, <laughs> she sat there. She was cool. I had to put her passive car in every now and then. But, you know, that was that's now reality. Like, that's not unheard of, right? So uh, great examples. I'm curious, Natalie, what, what's your take? Yeah, very similar. Like, it. Uh... <laughs> I do a terrible job at this. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I have a husband, I have a, a young daughter and my husband's schedule is all over the place. Very crazy. Um, he's 
you know, two very um, focused careers of um, trying to advance both of them at the same time. Um, luckily, the village is is key. I um, We've had some help. Um, my mom has been a big help with us of kind of covering those gap spaces and those middle grounds like Lee was, was talking about. Um, you know, I, I kind of think back and I remember for probably for people out there listening. So I remember before I had kids, right? And and I've gotten the same questions like, oh, well, where, who's taking care of the kids? Well, oh, she's in the hotel room. It's fine. She's got, you know, right. <laughs> let's just, you know, laugh about it. But before I had kids, there was a, a couple of poignant moments that I remember I was, I was standing in a conversation. It was at a trade show and there were all male leaders of, of our company that were in this conversation and you know without even thinking somebody was talking about what was going on with their kids and what was happening at home and somebody said oh well my wife just took this new job and she had been staying at home and split second like without a thought one of the other guys says how can that happen who's managing the house what's going on like the sky is falling you know, that, that both of you guys have a job outside the house. And it, it was a little deflating, right. To hear somebody within leadership of, of the organization I was a part of that, that was immediately like, oh, it's a, the perspective was it's either one or the other. You can't have both. Um, and, and so I kind of went, no way that no, there's gotta be ways to, to overcome this. And so when I went to to business school, I remember listening to a panel and somebody asked that question and, and there was an executive, um, she was at Duke energy at the time. And she said, who your partner is, is super important (laughs) because they are your team. They are your collaboration. Just like, I think everybody here has, has brought up and agreed upon today. She's like finding the village to fill the gaps. Um, and she said, give yourself some grace. And the best way that I think about the grace is you have a lot of balls in the air. Some of them are glass and the other ones are rubber and you can drop the rubber ones, but right. making sure that, you know, our base fed yeah. and, and is yeah. safe is it's a glass ball and I got to catch that ball. And there's some glass balls with work and I got to catch that ball and there's some rubber balls. Um, and so if you kind of take that perspective that it's a cycle, it's a journey, it's not, you know, oh my gosh. Yes, I sent my kid to picture day and had no idea and her hair, you know, whatever it was, her hair wasn't combed. I didn't send the money. I didn't, you know, whatever it was that um, typically there's some grace out there and you got to give yourself some too. (laughs) You know, when when Megan was talking and actually when she first started with this question, I actually wrote down, give yourself some grace. That is on my notepad right here. And so, 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 so glad that one of you got, one of you went there because that is it. I mean, we have to, I love the glass versus the rubber ball analogy. That's, that's really cool. Good stuff there. We, by nature, want to like solve everything and plan and probably have some type A in there. And so right. I'm like, okay, I can let this thing go. <laughs> that's, not that's, as important. Right. that's right. Well, this has been, i tell you what, we, the, for the, the returning guests, you know, we play the, uh, the lightning round and for Lee, you know, we, we do this. I won't make it a pretty tight lightning round here. I only have three things I'm going to throw out at you all. But this is for our listeners. We're, tr- we're trying to give the listeners advice and guidance, you know, things that they can look into. And, we'll, and any of these answers, we'll make sure we put those in the show notes as well for listeners so they can jump on that. So maybe we'll start at the top up with, with Lee and we'll, we'll go Lee, Meg, and Natalie for our lightning round. Okay. So Lee, you can kick us off. What is your your favorite leadership book? It's that's such a hard one because there's a there's a million of them out there, but I am a huge Brene Brown fan. So I would say um, Dare to, Daring to Lead, I think, is my favorite book. Okay. Leadership book. Megan. Uh, I don't know that it's my favorite book because I I read books and then I forget about them and then 30 minutes after this. I'll be like, man, I really wish that I had, that I had mentioned that book, but um, <laughs> I've been, I've been picking up and putting back down a, a book by uh, Caldini called Influence. 
right? Yep. And it's kind of about the tricks and trades of understanding human connection and what motivates people to be influenced versus not wanting to be influenced. And, um, you know, that that's really what what power is, is the ability to influence. Right. And so right. I'm, I'm check that book out. It's really neat. It talks cool. about human psychology. So it's cool. 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 Right. Cool. Uh, again, hard question and I'm um, similar and I pick up things and put down things and read things and then go, oh, I should have said this one. Uh, <laughs> but I like, so on the kind of that psychology realm there, um, I've always really liked some of the work from Malcolm Gladwell because it sort of breaks down the underpinnings. I think what Megan was talking about of like influence and, and kind of this, this stuff and dare to lead. So um, there's some things in Blink and Outliers um, for where we're at. I, I really enjoyed the hard thing about hard things. Okay. Um, that one has, has been um, good, particularly for kind of the stage of, of company that we've, we've come through and been into. All right. Now, how about our lead going back, kicking back to you, uh, best leadership quote of all time? And I know Megan had a good one earlier. What, what would be one that, that resonates with you? Again, there's so that's that's a hard one to narrow down to. But one, and I I, I kind of have this one written down on my desk. But it's Anne Sweeney. She was the former president of uh, Disney ABC, and I really like. She said, "Define success on your own terms. Achieve it by your own rules, and build a life that you're proud to live." And I think that kind of culminates kind of all these key facets of you want to be a leader, but you want to try. It's again, this strive for balance, right? We're never going to get it, but just as close as you can get to having the best of all the different worlds that we're trying to, to have. Right. Megan? Sure. So I don't know how this is, but many people in industry, especially in tech, have never heard of Sandra Lerner. Sandra Lerner was kind of the OG of women in tech. She's the founder of Cisco Systems. She founded it in California with her husband back in the 80s, and they later sold it in the early 1990s. But she's the world's foremost authority on Jane Austen. She bought a home that belonged in the English countryside that used to be Jane Austen's family. She restored it. She sold Cisco. If you've ever heard of the makeup company Urban Decay, she started Urban Decay. Sandra Lerner is awesome. Sandra Lerner's famous quote is, the first rule of any game is to know that you're in one. The second quote from Sandra Lerner is uh, something along the lines of, and this is kind of controversial, and I don't know that I entirely agree with it, but she claims that the, the amount of time that a little girl spends wearing pink will be inversely comparable to her future income. Wow. Oh. Kind of mm. edgy, kind of edgy. Not I like that. I agree with it, but I do you like that? Consider it is edgy, but I that's really thought provoking. That's interesting. Yeah. It's deep. It makes me feel good because all my girls not on like me. So I'm <laughs> you're one <laughs> hey, Chris. That's right. That's right. How about you, Valerie? I love <laughs> that one. Gosh, they were so good. Both of them had really good ones. Um. Uh, yeah, and the pink one is is super thought provoking because I so I will say my daughter is three right now and I had this massive frustration because everything was pink when she especially when she was a baby like she can wear other colors it's okay so right. um, yeah I think there's this kind of always stuck is it's not what happens to us but our response that of what happens to us right. Um, and he goes on to say that hurts us, but I think that you can invert that and say that can help you too, right? Um, it's it, there's a lot of things that sometimes happen that are out of our control, and it's how we choose to respond to that. Both whether it's you know the fire of trying to balance balance that's a terrible word of of, of trying to you know manage that work life intersection, or whether it's um, what you're doing from a leadership perspective. And, you know, Megan, you had said earlier, even just like being okay with sitting in something that's sticky and that's hard. And so what you choose, how you choose to approach those things and how you choose to react to that, I think that is, that's always really resonated with me. 
Good stuff. That's that's three phenomenal ones right there. Now the last the last lightning round question, Lee, back to you. Most inspirational female leader. I mean, this one's like a, a a sort of an obvious one, but it's when I think of that, I Oprah Winfrey comes to mind. I mean, growing up in apartheid Mississippi, um, you know, moving to Chicago, having you know, just not ever taking no for an answer her whole career, blazing a trail where there was absolutely none there and then the way that she's done it it's just not it's not what she's achieved but how she's achieved it and what she's done with the success that she's had and how through collaboration she's elevated others um when you talk about megan you were talking about influence i mean the amount of people that she's been able to influence um throughout society i mean i just think she's just to me she's the standout like i said she's sort of the obvious choice but um i, I just i had to say it I had to have it be oprah all right, Megan. I always cheat at answering questions because I'm not <laughs> just going to give you one. So I'd, <laughs> I'd say Golda Meir, Margaret Thatcher, Condoleezza Rice, um, Cleopatra, right? They all come to mind as being great, great original female leaders. I believe that at least three of them are uh, type eight Enneagrams, if you follow Enneagram leadership structure, but um, it's, uh, it's pretty neat. Natalie? Um, so I'll take a little bit different approach, if okay. that's okay. Um, so I think one of the things that was always important to me, you know, when you um, you asked this question and the, the first thing I thought of, you know, you're like, oh, who, who out there in the world is kind of famous as a leader? Right. But then I thought of, you know, when you were in school and every year you, you're in your like first day of class and the teacher says, who are your heroes or who, you know, who do you look up to? And, and that was part of your little profile that you, you filled out. And, you know, I would always put my mom and my grandma. And I think it's so important for us to look for, um, you know, great inspiring people, even just within our own kind of sphere um, that are, that are motivating. And so, the reason I had put my grandmother is um, she had lost her husband when she had two kids in college and two kids still at home. It was the early seventies and they had a farm and every single person asked her, Oh, you're going to sell the farm. Aren't you going to get remarried? Aren't you? Who's going to run the farm? And she said, I am. And she did. And she grew the farm. I mean, it is, a successful family business now. Um, my uh, uncle and several of my cousins farm, and you know, just she was up on technology. They put in, um, if you know anything about farming, they put in irrigation systems, which were kind of new in the seventies. And you know, she would tell stories to me about sitting in line with the grain truck and selling grain and sewing my uh, my aunt's uh, prom dress. And the other guys got out of the truck and said, what are you doing? And she's like, nothing, just find my own business. <laughs> so, you know, to me, that was always somebody that was so inspiring throughout my entire life. And so I, I can't answer that question without saying, saying her. Um, I think someone that's probably a little bit less known is um, Cynthia Marshall, who's the CEO of the Dallas Mavericks. She's kind of um, raised through the ranks and has um, been in kind of a very outward facing um, role in a very male dominant organization and, and field previously. And um, I think that's, a, you know, people like that are kind of more quiet, but I think really inspiring to watch and follow. Absolutely. Absolutely. I love, and I do love the, that you tied the family in there. Did you know you go ask why we we love that that family that aspect of it. So this has been phenomenal. Um, the, just to get your the feedback from you all, the wisdom. You know, we call it Eco Ask Why. We we like to to have that why towards the end, and that will give you a chance to put closing remarks in there as well. So you know, maybe we can start back with Natalie. You take this off. So maybe you can finish this up as well for for the why part. So you know, why is it important to have women in leadership positions in industry? Yeah. So. I have this um, saying uh, is I always say I I love to drive 
better outcomes, right? No matter what I'm doing, kind of my passion is better outcomes for our organization, for, um, you know, our impact in the world, for people. And I think it is so key to have women in leadership to drive those better outcomes. You're going to drive better outcomes for um, individuals within the company. You're going to drive better outcomes for your culture. You're going to drive better outcomes really for innovation and for the industry. And if there's one thing that I can say, that's it's the best way I can sum it up is, is I think women in leadership truly do um, transform and drive better outcomes all across the board. Absolutely. Hands down. How about Megan? Because we're human beings. The, the statement requires no qualification beyond that. We're 51% of the population. The fact that it would require any explanation is the problem entirely. Absolutely. Lee? I think you, you hit it, right, Megan? We're, it's, we're 51%. Um, we definitely have equal representation at the table. I, I would even take it beyond, I mean, it's women, but it's, it's diversity across the board, right? Everyone's got unique talents, perspectives. The more of that that you bring to the table, the richer your end product, your company, your corporate culture, which I think is really important too. Um, and the more that we can extend that, I think the better we all are for it. I agree. I think this this first panel, women in leadership, you know, trying trying this out for Eco SY, I thought it was phenomenal. You ladies did a great job. Thank you for sharing for for so much insight and wisdom. For the listeners out there, check out the show notes. We'll have plenty of links to connect with Natalie, Megan, and Lee. You'll be able to go to their company, see you know their LinkedIn, all the different ways to connect with them, follow them, because they definitely are you know leaders in industry and. We, we really want to uh, to put them in front of everyone. So th- to each one of you, thank you so much for being on Eco Ask Why. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Chris. Wow. What an amazing panel interview. To have Natalie, Megan, and Lee share what they shared, the insight, the wisdom. These ladies, they brought the ultimate truth. You know, there are so many golden nuggets. So I encourage you, share this with someone. Share this with someone who needs to hear it, who needs to be encouraged, because we need more women in leadership, period. So thank you again to Natalie, Megan, and Lee. And remember, we're still collecting those war stories. We want to hear the the crazy things that are happening in the industry. So hit us up directly. You can go to the links in the show notes to find that. So thank you again. And remember, keep asking why.